But when they are fired, they glow like rose cups. The survival of the black genius was not confined to its retention among black folk in the new world. It had done, if it had done this only, it would have been an interesting or extraordinary phenomenon. The black genius revealed itself even in the dark recesses of slavery. You, you heard that uh, there was a great poet in Russia called Alexander Pushin, Pushkin. Alexander Pushkin was the grandson of a little slave boy who was taken from the banks of the Niger in Nigeria and given as a mascot to the czars of Russia. And he was so beautiful, they trained him and he became chief marshal of the Russian army. And his descendant, great-grandson, became this famous black man who first wrote the most beautiful, delicate poetry in Russian, Alexander Pushkin. You, you are familiar with the beauty of the novels produced by another Alexander, this time in France, Alexander Dumas. Alexander Dumas was the grandchild of another man taken from another river on the west coast, in this case from our country of Ghana, the River Volta, and sold into slavery, slavery in France, picked up literature very quickly, and produced some of the most beautiful novels in French literature. There is a woman who is a great-granddaughter of Dumas, who lives in Ghana today. She's there for all to see. Those are some of the historical linkages. I mean, do we even, even need to talk about this? The man who designed the city of Washington was a black surveyor. Now, how can a slave who up to 1850 was not per permitted to read and write acquire the genius which enables him to do this in a strange environment? The survival of the black genius is to be celebrated in history. It transcended the confines of black folk with marked contempt for oppression. The soul of black folk, like the genius of the classical world, has succeeded in making its captor captive in various positive cultural forms. That's a reference to a very interesting episode in history. You remember that at one stage, the Romans were conquered by the Greeks. But the Greeks were the arbiters of culture. And though they were slaves in the Roman courts, because they were learned, they taught their masters. Now, there's some kind of Survival in this sense, which transcends the physical bondage and deprivation which comes with position of discrimination and slavery. So, and, and this is a quotation, uh, please listen. Young whites have created a free and easy youth culture that turns on to the music and dance created by blacks. Young whites have created a free and easy youth culture that turns on to the music and dance created by blacks. That's also a quotation. The writer of this quotation might well have said with abundant truth that white folk in the New World and other parts of the world have been liberated from the restraints of their unnatural attitude to life by the music and dance of black men. When I was young, studying in Europe, the most popular dance was the waltz. And you know how leisurely and measured the waltz rhythm is. And it, 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 would be, it would have been unthinkable to see a young English pair dancing any kind of jazz or, or pop music. 
But with the popularity that was developed with the sensitivity of jazz music, this has captured the dance halls of the world. And now you even have bump <laughs> from clapping, which is African. It was, it was considered to be noisy. And, and when gentlemen and ladies meet, or ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, the liberators, <laughs> when they meet, they have to act with elegance and grace and poise. It's barbarous to shout and clap. It's primitive. And now you don't have a dance where you don't pound the floors and dance and shake. Then you are with it. <laughs> By striving to emulate the black man's self-expression through music, dance, and <coughs> language, the peoples of the so-called white race are shedding their frigidity and regaining their natural humanity. I ask them to cling to their humanity. It supersedes technology. Perhaps here one may find a positive rationale for wishing to have the black man's potentialities developed to their highest possible pitch, for holding his achievements to public view, for praying and working to bring about the attainment of eventual coexistence in peace and understanding between black and white. For no man is an island unto himself. And being black may be one of the most effective means of giving the so-called white race a reason the earth at all. So much Western cultural life has been made possible by the black presence that it does not make sense to reject that presence. So much more is yet to emerge from that presence. Dark Africa, I who raised the regal pyramids and held the fortunes of conquering Caesars in my tempting grasp. Dark Africa, who nursed the doubtful child of civilization on the wandering banks of life-giving Nile and gave to the teeming nations of the world a Gresham gift. Thank you. I think I can thank Dr. Diana on behalf of everybody here for an enlightening lecture. And we'll open the floor now for questions. There will be a reception for Dr. Diana at the Black Cultural Center after this session. And tomorrow morning from 10 to 12, black students from Iowa State who went to Africa this summer will present a slideshow on their experience now. I have been intentionally provocative in this delivery and presentation, but I want to have a response from the audience. And it doesn't matter how rude your question is, I will take it. <laughs> you asked uh, you asked during the lecture to have comments on the slave trade. And I'd like to for you to discuss the difference between African slavery as it recently yeah. did. Well, that, that's a very interesting subject. And it arises from the fact that uh, when blacks talk about slavery as a curse in their life, uh, whites retort by saying, but after all, you were sold by your people. And it's been a kind of propaganda that was used to drive a wedge between the blacks on the continent and the blacks in the new world. Forget it. You, you have nothing in common. They didn't like you. It's just, it's just they who sold you. They were part of the business. But the thing that must be said is the cultural differences in the practice of slavery between the African continent and the New World. In Africa, for various reasons, a man was ens enslaved. 
Sometimes they even opted to bring themselves into slavery. Sometimes they needed money, which they didn't have. So they said, take my daughter. If I find the money, I'll come back for her. Sometimes they never find the money. And the girl is sold into physical slavery in that sense. Whatever happens to her is not the mother's uh, concern. They did this. Another reason for having that institution was that um, in Africa, in our relations with the Western world, we were very impressed and attracted by the commodities they brought. We gave them gold. Can you imagine that? If, if, if it happened, my grandfather used to say, we put pots of gold down for them to exchange for plates, mirrors, shaving blades, things like that, which they did not manufacture. And why that happened is also a very interesting area of study. So it is true that we participated in the trade, but our expression of it was not so heinous, not so barbarous, not so calamitous as this practice became in this country. And you know why the practice dwindled <laughs> into that situation. Men became mere chattels, tables and chairs, to their owners. In Africa, you were a slave only for a certain period. If you returned the money, you were free. There was no constitutional or legal right about slavery. So it was practiced in that kind of environment. And people who became good slaves eventually became principal members of the community. There is in my society today, in my own family, members who were bought by my grandfather and the descendants of members who were bought by my grandfather and my grandmother. My wife gets upset sometimes when we go home and they come to us and say, cousin, do you have anything today? And she's, she doesn't forget that they were the descendants of the slaves. But we, we don't worry. She says that only as a jest. But, but Michael, you forgot that their grandmother was so and so. We give them special names to identify them. But they get out of it quickly. And right now, as I speak, one of the children of that so-called slave is here studying medicine in this country. My kids also studied medicine. So when they go back home, they will be at par, no difference. But the institution which was developed here, especially in the North American continent, took a particularly abrasive turn and ended in discrimination oppression and treatment that was very unhappy. It is strange that the black people survived that experience and became what they are. And you know that this was particularly so in the North American continent because in the South, owing to the particular nature of the Latin culture, slaves very quickly emerged into the dominant society and became part of it. So slavery was not so objectionable in South America as it became in North America. And when people talk about this, about the African involvement, it is good to draw out this line very clearly so they understand. I am, right, I teach a course in the, in the university. Do you know that uh, 600 years after the birth of Christ, someone arose who claimed to be the prophet of God and instituted the worship of Al in the Middle East, roughly in the same region as you know, the area where Christianity originated, and uh, developed this concept in North Africa. And it, it was patterned with the culture of a new religion which involved the totality of life. And after its establishment in North Africa, you had waves of migrations which brought Islam to West Africa at a most critical period in the history of West Africa, when the empires of Ghana, Mali, and Shanghai had developed great heights of glory and power. And these Muslim representatives came along with a sword. You accept the Islam religion or we kill you. And a lot of people accepted the religion of Islam in that way. So I'm always sometimes
thousand by the special rather special acceptance of Islam by black folk in this country in contradistinction to the Judeo-Christian religion. The difference between the two in Africa is that they are foreign religions. They came from the Middle East, like Christianity and, and Islam. But before then, our people had their own traditional religion. Those who are scholars of anthropology are aware of the works of, our, of an African anthropologist, uh, Dr. Mbisi of East Africa, who has a study on this religious aspect of African life in a book called The Concept of God in Africa. And he quotes a prayer which is used by the pygmies. <coughs> pygmies are the lowest form of existence in Africa. And yet their concept of God is one of the highest. The prayer begins, in the beginning was God. And it goes on to elaborate that sense of God. It talks about God being the word. And it says, and that word, how powerful. If, if you didn't know about its origins, you would say they were reflecting St. John chapter 1, verse 1. But there's no connection. So Christianity came in the same way as an external religion, as Islam. And Islam made very good inroads in the culture, into the culture of our people, and established ideas like weaving and uh, iron foundry work and, uh, and uh, the relationship between man and his wife and children and so on. As a matter of fact, in 1822, when a British explorer first went to Nigeria, to the northernmost part of the country, Hugh Clapperton is his name, he found the Sultan of Sokoto sitting down on his king, reading the elements of Euclid in Arabic. This is one of the cultural benefits of Islam in Africa. But that presence destroyed the empires that were built. It, it said the last word to the Songhai Empire, which spread from the western section of the Atlantic right up to Lake Chad, the biggest empire that ever stood in the Middle Ages right up to the 13th century. And in fact, in the 14th century, one of the leaders of the Mali Empire, which is one before the Song, became so powerful that he made a pilgrimage as a Muslim to Mecca, carrying tons of gold with him, which is recorded in history. So Islam has had that kind of appeal to the African people who are inclined to look upon it as traditional. But it is not. It is also foreign, like Christianity. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, do you think more, more blacks in America are sort of refraining from uh, converting to the Islamic faith because they fear um, cultural uh, non-cultural acceptance on the part of uh, Africans? Yeah. Oh no. But you don't improve it by taking an Islamic name as such. If you want a name, let me give you an African name. There's plenty you can take. You don't have to be a Muslim to have an African name. That's an, an important thing. It's not essential. In the same way as uh, they distorted our culture by saying you are Christian. That's a difference with me. You go to the church, they take you in their arms as the elder did and put sprinkled water there and make the cross and say, from today, you are not called Kwame. You are called Michael. It sticks. Now, as you know, Michael means a friend of God. How dare you? How, how, how can I assume a name like this? But Kwame is traditional. It's related to the ceremony of express. So if the missionaries were clever, they would have used this system of naming the child as co-equal with the system of baptism. 
so that on the eighth day they will perform the same ceremony, give you your African name, and take you into the church and teach you a new kind of religion. And the only difference between the African respect for God and the Christian form is the lack of knowledge which Africans had about Christ. Christianity talks out about Christ. And we, I've said to a class recently here that with us, our resistance to colonial rule was not through a study of philosophy, like you have done in the Western world, reading Rousseau, Hobbes, and, and the others, and uh, take up the idea of the liberty of the individual, the sovereignty of the state. We, we haven't grown up that way. We've grown up through uh, an awareness of the presence of God as our Father. The, the sense of universal brotherhood makes it wrong for anyone to keep us in subjection. If we have the same father, what right have you to think yourself superior to me? It doesn't exist in religion. So we have struck the blow against colonial rule because we believe strongly in the universality of God. That's why we say that um, you, you shouldn't worry in this country about us going communist. I know that your state department has a B in its thick body about communism in Africa. Hey, they've gone to Angola only to stop the Russians from going there. In the strange belief that if they allow the Russians to go there and Angola becomes independent, then the African regime will be communist. Look at how long we've been independent, since 1957. There is not a single communist state in Africa yet. And yet, because of our economic deprivation, we take help from every quarter. If the communists give us bread, we take it. There's no such thing as communist bread. Bread <laughs> is bread. position on the issue as well as on the general issue of liberation in Africa has been very positive from the very day of independence. In fact, one of the things that uh, upset our progress to sovereignty and greatness was the fact that our country spent so much of its time and resources in helping other African countries to be independent. And on the eve of our independence, our first prime minister in a public place and said, the independence of Ghana is meaningless without the total liberation of the African continent. We are, we are in great support. And indeed, in 1966, we are organizing an all-African force to take an army against Rhodesia. When the man who was organizing this was removed from power by a military coup. But the organization which is responsible for Total action in Africa, the Organization of African Unity, has taken a strong stand and they have a fund which they use to help the guerrilla activities throughout Southern Africa. It began with the Mozambique, it supported Angola, and we are very strongly in support of the movement in Rhodesia. We even have people working in South Africa today to liberate that country from minority rule. I'm not a politician. No. What do you think of the Transkei situation? The Transkei situation is interesting. Uh, as you know, the principle, the policy of government in South Africa is based on the theory of separateness. That the black man hasn't got the culture of the white man, so he must live in his area away from the area of the white man. But they use the black man in the labor fields, in the mines, to produce the economy of the white man's world. So they produce this up to the limit where they cut up 
areas of Africa as settlements for the black people. You, these are your homesteads. You were traditionally living there, and you should stay there. And they have pushed this to the limit where they have declared one of these states, which they refer to as the Bantu stand, independent last month. Now, that independence crystallizes, formalizes the doctrine of apartheid, the separateness. So it is rejected. It is rejected totally. Not a single member of the United Nations has recognized this phony independence. And it will not work. And incidentally, the Prime Minister of South Africa is going to be interviewed in Face the Nation on Sunday at 11.30. If you are interested in those questions, don't miss it. Face the Nation, 11.30, Sunday. Prime Minister John Foster. Did I answer, excuse me, did I answer your question? Okay, the African slaves moved up in society and they became equal, but you know, the people that were not slaves, they were the masters. Right. Okay, as far as slavery is in America, the black man, well, we are no longer slaves physically, but mentally we are still slaves. We are oppressed, we are still rated as inferior. The question is for in the process, you know, the process, the answers to the The answer is straightforward. If they do not liberate you totally, this civilization will go down with you. Because we know this in Africa. The areas where people are oppressive against their black slaves have developed a very interesting pattern. In any house where the masters were cruel to their slaves, something very interesting happened. And you can find it today. Those who are interested in this study, I invite you to come with me to my country and I will point at specific houses where this has happened. The house was prosperous because it dealt in slavery. It made a lot of money. You know what happened? The male and female members of the family were wiped out completely. And the slaves took over. There are many houses, as an example, in Africa today. If the people were harsh with their slaves, the repression was severe for the masters. And I think they know that it is in their interest to liberate you, quite apart from economic reasons. So without your labor, the cotton plantations would not have developed. You know that they, they tried to use Indian slaves uh, for the plantation. No, they began with quite indentured labor. They were too weak to work. And as soon as they made their money, they were no longer interested in plantation work. So they tried the Indians. The Indians knew the terrain so well that they could run away. They could not be traced. And besides, they didn't like that kind of heavy work anyway. And they brought us. And we sweated and toiled and cried. And we held the plantation. And we produced the cotton and the sugar and the tobacco, which provided the basis for the formation of capital in this country. So we've done a lot to rear up this economy in your new world. So whatever you do to us, don't think you are making charity. You are saving yourself. And I'm saying this again as a, a special appeal to all of you, black and white. Because it is only in harmony, as I mentioned at the tail end of my address, that the world can be saved. And anything you do to help the black man, don't think you are doing that in kind of charity or Christian feeling. It is self-interest. You are helping to advance the culture of your nation. And you are helping to redeem the mistakes of the past. And it is only in that spirit that we shall have survived. Political significance of the UN. Right. right. Well, the only difficulty there is the fact that with the veto at 
the Security Council. It's difficult to get the new nations of the world to express their identity. You know, when they formulated the, uh, the Charter of the United Nations, they built into it this thing of the five original powers which fought and destroyed Hitler. And they reserved the power to destroy anything they don't like. And they've used it systematically against resolutions and motions that are not in the interest of the richer half of the world. But remember that this world is made up of two-thirds black and one-third white. You, you know what has happened recently with the expression of the oil companies? They sat up one day and said, no, you won't have oil anymore. And they suffered. And we suffered in the rest of the world. If the nations of the third world so-called, I call them the developing world, which control the raw material resources of the world, get up one day and make a kind of organization to restrict the flow of raw material, your industries in the West will be emasculated yeah. from operation. And this will be tragic, not only for you, but for us as well. So don't force us to do that while there is time. Soon the time will come when if we don't look out, we shall be faced with the impossible. But we can save ourselves through the peculiar genius of the human race, and we must use it for the obvious purpose for which we were brought into the world. Thank you. As I said earlier, we'll continue the discussion at the Black Cultural Center. And tomorrow's slideshow, in case I didn't mention, will be here in the gallery at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.